Well, we're continuing our series called Story, and I want to encourage you to, uh, to uh, take uh, your sermon notes there, if you would, that are in your bulletin, and you can jot down a few notes as you feel led. And if you take your Bible and turn to one of my favorite stories in the Bible, Mark chapter 2. Mark, the second chapter, and uh, we're going we're gonna to spend some time there this morning. If you don't have a Bible, there's one near you or around you, and you can turn to page uh, 762, and you can follow along with us. Um, we are continuing this series. Um, we've been looking at different aspects of our unique story, that God has made us unique. And you know, we say that all the time to people, but when you start looking at how God has wired you, and how he's gifted you, and how he's given you certain opportunities in life and so forth, it really is amazing how unique we all are, isn't it? Um, it's been exciting to kind of hear how people have been discovering their unique story. Um, so far, we have looked at the S in our story, which is spiritual gifts, and uh, we've tried to help you discover the gifts that God has given you. Uh, I realized that when we kind of put this material together, that we didn't give anyone a next step you know, what do I do now that I've discovered my spiritual gifts? Well, next week, we're going to have a handout at the back table that will help you figure out if this is your gift, here's, where, here's some opportunities you can serve here at New Life. We really want you to share your story, not just discover it, but use your story to make a difference in our church, our community, in our world. The T uh, is for temperament, our personality. And last week, Pastor John shared, you know, about our temperament, and uh, we learned a little bit more about, that was fun, wasn't it? You know, discovering a little bit more of our personality, and I don't know if you have had the chance to uh, take that personality test online, um, but that's a lot of fun, discovering which animal you are. And um, if you're not sure what we're talking about, you can go to our website and click on the story banner, and you can find the personality test there. Today, we're going to look at um, opportunities, which is the O in our, in our acronym story. And um, as we begin this morning, I want us to think about opportunities on two different levels. One level is looking back at our lives and looking at the opportunities that God has given us. You know, some of those unique opportunities, God has given some of you educational opportunities, he has given you spiritual opportunities. He's given you even some painful opportunities. And as you look back, you can kind of reflect back on how God might want to use that to make your story unique. And so on the back table, we have um, just a one-page handout we'd like to give you, and it helps you kind of develop a timeline of your life. This is really fun to do as a life group or with a group of people where you start from the beginning and you look at the, the, the stuff above the line or the high points of your life, the stuff below the line or low points, and it just kind of helps you like reflect back a little bit on your life, the opportunities that God has given you so that you can use to serve him and share your story. So that's back at the back table. I want to encourage you to pick one of those up. Also, if you haven't gotten one of our devotions yet, our daily devotions, uh, this little booklet has been written by people in our church, and uh, it is so neat to see some of the insights that our people have brought to this story series, and so I encourage you to pick one of those up. Those, those are all at no cost, so I, I encourage you to take advantage of that. Another aspect of opportunities, though, are those opportunities that, that God gives us now, here and now, right now, those opportunities that, that happen around us. And so today, I want us to kind of look at um, both of those as we kind of look at this story found in Mark chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 12. Before we begin, can I just ask you to pray with me as we ask God to speak to us? Lord, I, I thank you so much for the things you've, shared, you've taught me this week. And right now, God, we want to pause and offer up to you the two things you've created, your word and our lives. And I pray that you would so interchange the two that we would leave this place knowing that we've heard from you, God. I pray uh, for Pastor Dave and Gina, that you keep them safe and help them as they take their daughter Carrie to, uh, to, to college and just help them through this time of transition for John and Trish as well. Lord, watch over them this weekend and for their daughter Ashton as she makes this transition. And God, we just ask that you'd be our teacher, our ultimate teacher this morning. We ask this for your sake, Jesus. Amen. 
You know, every once in a while, I'll be watching a baseball game on TV, and when the batter comes to bat, they will often put next to the batter this little box. And it's a box that has, you know, shows the hitting zone. It shows where the hitter's sweet spot is. You know, the, the red zones in that, in that box are where he's likely to swing and miss. And the green areas are where he's most likely to get a hit. You know, this, if it's on the outside of the plate or inside or whatever. And I think the Giants are still trying to figure out where the green boxes are um, these days. But anyways, um, you know, those of you who golf, you, um, you know how the importance of finding your sweet spot, right? Of hitting the ball uh, on that mark, you know? Uh, I, I don't golf anymore because I give new meaning to the word hook or slice, you know, I spend most of my time looking for golf balls rather than, you know, hitting them. That's my problem. And so, but, you know, it's important to find your sweet spot when you golf. Tennis players, if there's any tennis players here, you know the importance of finding your sweet spot. You know, hitting the ball in the sweet spot, right? Um, you know, if you don't, that ball can go anywhere and everywhere, right? Well, the truth is, is that you have a sweet spot spiritually, God has given you a place, a sweet spot that he wants you to discover. Call it your, your strength zone or your peak performance or whatever. It is that place where your gifts, your talents, your abilities, God's grace, and people's needs all intersect. It's that place where your uniqueness, God's grace, and people's needs intersect. That's your sweet spot. That's what this series is really meant to be. It's meant to be about you finding your sweet spot. I love how Galatians chapter 6, verses 4 and 5 are in the message version. Let's read that together. It says this, Make a careful exploration of who you are and the work that you've been given. And then sink yourself into that. Don't be impressed with yourself. Don't compare yourself with others. Each of us must take the responsibility for doing the creative best you can with your own life. I love that, because that's really what we're trying to do, is help you to, to make a careful exploration of who you are and the work God's given you to do. Not to compare ourselves to others, but to do our creative best with what God's given us. Well, today we want to look at how to optimize our opportunities. Someone has once said this. They said that success in life lies in recognizing and utilizing our opportunities, Success lies in, in recognizing and utilizing our opportunities. Um, you know, there's times in my life when, when I haven't recognized or utilized those opportunities that God's brought my way. Um, maybe that's happened to you. Maybe you've wasted opportunities because uh, God has brought something to you and you haven't recognized it. Paul put it this way in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. He says, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Well, how do you do that? Um, how, how, do you, how do you utilize, recognize, and utilize the, 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 the opportunities that God brings our way? Well, I, I'd like for us to kind of discover how to do that through the, a story in the life and ministry of Jesus. It can give us a window, if you would, into how to recognize and utilize opportunities that God gives and brings to us. I'd like to read Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, so we kind of get the, the context, and then kind of look um, at some principles that we can learn and pull from this story. It says this in verse 1, when Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread that he was back home. As soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no room even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him in to see Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on the mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. Some of the teachers of the religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus immediately knew what they were thinking, and so he asked them, why do you question in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. 
Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we have never seen anything like this before. This story is really all about opportunities. I think one of the reasons God gave it to us in the New Testament is for us to see how we can recognize and utilize the opportunities God gives us. So I'd like to just kind of share with you briefly this morning some things that we can learn, principles we can learn about opportunities. Would you write this down for number one? Opportunities arise by being aware of the needs around us. Opportunities arise by being aware of the needs around us. You see, the reason this story is even in the Bible is because these four men came carrying this paralytic man to Jesus. Now, they could have decided to go and see Jesus by themselves. They could have said, you know what, we just want to be in the presence of Jesus. But they saw a need. They saw a need to carry their, this, this paralytic man to Christ. We're called to do that as well. We're called to carry people to Jesus. Well, they could have you know, said, uh, we'll, we'll just take care of ourselves. But you know, and sometimes, I don't know about you, but we put our head down and we, we go at life so hard that sometimes we miss those opportunities God brings along to us. Now, as I looked at this passage this past week, I don't know about you, but as I've read this passage in the past and I've shared this passage, I always assume that these four carriers knew the paralytic man, that they were somehow, it was a friend of theirs that they were bringing to Jesus. But you know what? There, as I looked at this passage, there are no indicators that they even knew they even had a relationship with this paralytic man. There's nothing that tells us that this was a friend of theirs. It could have been. It could have been a friend. I mean, after all, going through all that work to try to get a, a person to, to Jesus. But it could have been a stranger along the way. The point I'm trying to make is this, is that they were aware. They saw the need. And they said, it's not, we're not just going to go see Jesus for ourselves. We're going to carry this paralytic man to Jesus. Opportunities arise when, when we ask God to make us aware of the needs around us. Would you write this down? God is more concerned about your availability than your abilities. He's more concerned about your availability than your ability. If you will make yourself available to God, he will use you. You don't have to have a bunch of degrees or certificates after your name to be used by God. You don't have to have your life completely together. If you say, God, you know, the most dangerous prayer you can pray is what? God, use me. <laughs> because he will. He'll bring opportunities to you. Jesus put it this way in John chapter four. Don't you say it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe unto harvest. Some of you are in the middle of harvest right now. You know, every, every day I come to the office, I watch these corn stalks growing out here. And I just cannot believe how much higher and taller they're getting. And I think there's still about a month left before harvesting them, right? I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. But, you know, Jesus says the harvest is now. People are ready and ripe and, and willing and desiring to hear about Jesus, about the Savior. We just need to ask God to open our eyes. You know, I heard a story about a lady who lost her husband and each week she would visit his graveside. And often when she was visiting uh, her husband's grave, she would hear sobbing coming from a nearby grave marker. And it happened to be this lady, and so she went over and just started talking to this lady, and she says, you know, I'm so lonely. I, I miss him. Well, Thanksgiving was, about, uh, was approaching, and she said, you know what, why don't you come have dinner at our house, or at my house. And so the two of them that year met together and they just, you know, comforted one another. Well, the next year she decided to invite some more people that were in that same situation and some more. And, and pretty soon, this past Thanksgiving, 28 people came to her home for Thanksgiving dinner who were grieving or lonely or hurting. Friends, it all starts with just simply being aware of the needs around us. Now, I'm not saying that we have to meet every need. I'm not saying that on the way home today, you stop every 50 feet and you know, you know, meet the need that's, that's around us. 
But as you make yourself available to God and you say, God, here I am, he will lead you, he will prompt you, he will give you those opportunities. There have been times I've been driving my car and God will just kind of nudge me and sometimes he'll have to slap me upside the head because that's how I am, but he'll say, turn the car around and go help that person. As you make yourself available to God, he will use you. But it starts, those opportunities begin by being aware of the needs around us. Max Licato in his book, The Cure for the Common Life, says this, use your uniqueness to make a big deal of God wherever you go in life. Use your uniqueness, the, the, the way God has designed you to make a big deal about Jesus wherever you are in life. There's a second thing I learned about opportunities in this story, and that's this, is that opportunities often emerge out of times of pain and loss. Opportunities emerge out of times of pain and loss. This story is in the Bible because this paralytic needed an encounter with Jesus. He was in pain. He experienced pain and loss. And they would, these guys would do whatever they could to get their, their friend or their newfound friend to Jesus. God can do that to us as well. Your greatest ministry in life may come from the greatest pain that you've experienced in life. Isn't that true? Pastor and author A.W. Tozer said this, it is doubtful that God can use a person greatly until he has hurt him deeply. That doesn't mean that God's a sadistic God that goes around loving to hurt people, but what it means is that God uses broken people. He uses people that their, their will is broken, their stubbornness is broken, and sometimes you have to go through some painful experiences in order for that to happen. God wants to take the messes of our life and bring a message from it. Now, not everything that happens in our life is good, is it? Not everything that happens to us is good. But somehow, some way, God can bring good even from those hurtful and painful experiences. I love the way the Apostle Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, He comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they're troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. God comforts you and me, not to keep it to ourselves, friends but to help others and comfort others. What better person to minister to somebody who's going through something than the person who's gone through it? You know, our grief share ministry here at New Life was started by a couple who lost their daughter tragically. And they had such a heart to help people who are going through that season of grief that Jerry and Lee Marie Balin said, I, we, we want to lead a group like that. Our divorce care ministry is is being led by a person who's gone through a very painful experience. Our Celebrate Recovery ministry here at New Life is led by, by people who have gone through some dark places and dark times in their life, and they've, they've come out of those things, and they want to help others and encourage others and, and help others be accountable. Many of you have gone through times of pain and loss in your life. Can I tell you this? If you make yourself available to God, God can even use those times in your life. There are so many people, we get white cards every week, and I cannot believe how many people in our church are struggling with cancer. What better person to encourage somebody who is, who's, has cancer than somebody who's gone through that and, 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 and has seen God work? Some of you might recognize the name Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey is a financial expert. He's on the radio quite a bit. Um, we use this Financial Peace University material here, and we're going to have another class this fall with Financial Peace. What you may not know is that Dave Ramsey had to file bankruptcy a few years back. And in that process, he thought, well, I better learn a different way to manage my finances. <laughs> and so he started reading God's word and looking at practices and started talking and sharing those practices. And pretty soon, his Financial Peace University material just took off. I don't know how God's going to use the pain and loss in your life, but I will tell you this, he will if you'll let him. He'll take the mess of your life and, give, and bring a message from it. In 2009, 2010, when my wife and I went through the heartbreak of seeing a personal dream of mine, the church that we had for nine years tried to get up and going and established and, and self-supported, we had to close our doors 
It was a really dark time in my life. But you know what? God brought into my life 10 different church planters who had gone through the, the same experience. And I was able to, to just share with them through my experience that God was not finished with them yet. That God still had a plan and a purpose and God could bring something good from it. And I, I just counsel them to guard their heart against resentment and bitterness. I mean, who would have ever thought that God would give me a ministry to failed church planters? <laughs> God somehow can use the pain and loss in your life. There's a guy in our church who has, both, has had both knees replaced. And every time I hear about somebody who has to have knee replacement surgery, I call this guy and say, Jack, would you call this person and encourage them and pray for them? I mean, I don't know how God's going to use the pain and loss in your life, but he will. When we first came to New Life, I started a group called Waiting for Work. Because I had been out of work after we closed our church. And I knew the hard, hardship and the, the, the challenge and the discouragement that could set in. And I just wanted a place for people to come and, and be prayed for and be encouraged and let them know that God's not finished with them yet. Some of you in this room were in that first group. And there were people who would come to that group sometimes and they would, they would just weep. They would say, you know, I, I, I'm supposed to be strong for my spouse right now, but I'm hurting. I, I don't know how this is going to all work out. Friends, I don't know how God's going to use the pain and loss in your life, but he will. And your greatest ministry in life could be born out of something that was so painful it's hard for you to talk about. After this, past, this last service, a lady came up to me. And she said, Pastor Jim, I'm interested in starting a group for sexual assault victims. I mean, even God can use even something like that. You know, it's, it's exciting to me to see how God's going to use this series in the lives of people as he stirs their heart to meet needs in our church, our community, and our, in our world. Can I plant a seed? You know, again, I just share with you that those white cards that come through, there are so many people in our church that are struggling with cancer. I would love to have a place for them to go and be prayed for and, and be encouraged and let them know that, you know, God's in control. There are so many people on those white cards that are dealing with depression right now and struggling with depression. I'd love to have a group, a support group, an encouragement group that says, you know what, you'll get through this. God's, in, he has, a, he's a God of hope and you'll come out the other side. You know, I was talking to a group of people recently. I, I had to sit in on a life group for somebody and, and I just said, you know, one of the things I love about New Life that's a lot different than some of the churches I've been involved in is that we believe that out of our brokenness, God uses us the most. That we don't have to have our life cleaned up. We don't have to have it all together in order for God to use us. That oftentimes it's out of that brokenness that God has the most significant ministry in mind for us. Friends, opportunities emerge out of those times of pain and loss. God never wastes a hurt. There's a third thing I learn about opportunities in this story is this, is that opportunities are not without obstacles. They're not without obstacles. I mean, when these guys brought this paralyzed man to Jesus, they couldn't get in the house. It was a packed house. And I'm not sure, I would love to know which of those four guys whose idea it was to say, hey, I got an idea. Let's cut a hole in the roof and lower this guy through to, to in front of Jesus. I'd also like to know who paid for the repair bill uh, on the roof afterwards. Sometimes opportunities are not without obstacles. They require out-of-the-box kind of faith. They could have played it safe. They could have refused to take a risk. They could have said, well, we got close. It just wasn't meant to be. But they didn't do that, did they? J. Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China, said this, I have found that there are three great stages in every work of God, great work of God. First, it is impossible. Second, it is difficult. Third, it is done. And how many times has God asked us to do something and we said, God, I can't do that. That's impossible. 
And then through God's grace and strength and power, somehow we get it done. You know, whenever you attempt something great for God, you can expect obstacles, you can expect resistance. Someone has said this, that if, you've, if you haven't felt the resistance of the enemy recently in your life, it could be because you're headed in the same direction that he is. Ouch. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 7. He said, keep on asking and you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you'll find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. Friends, opportunities are not without obstacles. Sometimes we think we just were, were to ask once and everything's supposed to fall in place. If God has laid something on your heart, sometimes it, it takes multiple asks, and it takes a process of, of seeing that come into reality. But I can tell you this, that if God leads you to it, he'll lead you through it, friends. That if God leads you to do something, he'll give you the strength and the grace and the power to get through it. Opportunities are not without obstacles. And sometimes I think some of those obstacles are put in our path by an enemy that doesn't want to see great things happen for God. I tell leader, our life group leaders a lot, uh, not you know, often is you need to find a prayer partner, somebody who will pray for you on the day you meet. Because that's when Satan gets really active. A fourth thing I've learned about opportunities from this story is this, is that opportunities often appear as interruptions. They often appear as interruptions. Picture this with me in your mind. Here's these Pharisees and these, te these religious teachers. They're sitting, listening to Jesus, and all of a sudden they feel something on their tunics and, and they, on their head dressings. And, and they look up and this dust and this dirt are kind of falling on them. And they're thinking, what in the world is going on here? And their agenda got interrupted as these guys lowered this guy in front of Jesus. Sometimes opportunities appear as interruptions. Is there anybody here that likes interruptions to their schedule? <laughs> There's a group for that if you do. Um, it's called Codependency. It meets on Monday nights at CR. I encourage you to check it out. Um, you know, I, I don't like interruptions to my, my schedule. But you know what I've learned along the way throughout the years is that many times those interruptions are the very ministry opportunities God's bringing to me. I challenge you sometime to take a look at the pages of the Bible and just read through the pages of the Bible and look at how many times God interrupted an individual in the Bible and then used that interruption for his intended purposes. It's pretty incredible. God came to a man named Noah and said, Noah, I want you to build an ark. It's gonna take 120 years, Noah, but it'll save you and your family. God came to a man named Abraham and said, Abraham, I want you to leave your family and your familiar surroundings, and I want you to go to the land that I promise you. And by the way, Abraham, when you get to the land, there's gonna be a famine in the land. God came to a man named Moses, interrupted Moses' life and said, go and stand before Pharaoh and tell my people, let Tell him, let my people go. God came to a man named David, the youngest of eight children, the least likely to be king of Israel, and said, David, you're going to be the one that's going to lead my people. God came to a young woman named Mary and interrupted her life and said, Mary, you are going to be the incubator for the Savior of the world. God came to Paul and interrupted Paul's life Paul today would be, probably be considered a terrorist. He hated Christians. He put them to death. And God said, Paul, you hate Christians, but guess what? You're going to become one of them. And you're going to be the leading spokesperson for Christianity, the least likely candidate. Now, what would have happened if, if guy, these individuals said, you know what? I, I don't have time for that. <laughs> uh, God, you're interrupting my plans. You're interrupting my schedule. Can you imagine what would have happened? What if, what if Noah said, I don't do arcs? <laughs> or what if Moses said, I don't do plagues, God? Or what if David said, I, I don't do giants? What if Mary said, I don't do virgin births? What if Jesus said, I don't do crosses? Friends, God, sometimes God will interrupt our lives 
And he'll use those very interruptions as opportunities to have a significant ministry in someone's life. Don't ignore those. Because really, those interruptions sometimes can lead us to the last point I want to make this morning, and it's this. Opportunities are divine appointments to introduce people to Jesus. They're divine appointments to introduce people to Jesus. You see, the whole purpose of this story is that they lowered their friend in front of Jesus. And Jesus said to him, son, which means young man, could have been a teenager, could have been a young adult. He said, your sins are forgiven. Now, not all sickness is due to sin in our life. There are some people in the Bible that suffered. They were righteous and they were blameless people. But in this story, there was something this man did that caused, uh, caused his sickness for Jesus to say, I forgive your sins. And I'll prove to you that your sins are forgiven. I will heal you. I will ask you to take up your mat and walk. Opportunities are divine appointments to bring, to carry people to Jesus. Can I ask you this morning, who are you carrying to the Lord? This could have been a result of some foolish choices this young man made or some consequences of things he did along the way. We don't know, but we do know this, that Jesus said, son, your sins are forgiven. He will say that to you today if you'll let him. He will say, son, he'll say, daughter, your sins are forgiven. God gives us those opportunities, those divine appointments to show people the love of Jesus. You may be the only Bible people read, friends. God wants you to be a living Bible to people. They may not open the, the pages of the Bible. They may, not, they may not darken the doors of a church, but they'll read your life. God is, wants to use our gifts, our talents, our abilities to show a hurting world what Jesus is like. Would you let him do that? This morning as you entered, you were, uh, you were given a crayon. And uh, that crayon was not meant to be in case you got bored with the message. Um, Max Licato tells a story that when he was young, his parents used to take him to church and in this small Texas church, there was this rather rotund Bible teacher who taught this Bible class that he was in. He describes her as only Max can, that she had black horn rimmed glasses that stuck out at the sides like a masquerade mask. He said, she smelled like my mom's makeup, and her ankles were too big for her heels. But he said she was like a kid at Christmas when she saw us coming to her class. There were hugs when we entered the class. There were hugs when we left. And he said that she enjoyed giving us each a box of crayons and a sketch of Jesus torn from a coloring book. Take the crayons I gave you, she would instruct, and color Jesus. And so we would. We didn't illustrate pictures of ourselves. We colored the Son of God. We didn't pirate crayons from other boxes. We used the crayons that she gave us. And so I would put my tongue between my teeth and I would, I would start coloring. That was the fun of it. Do the best you can with the box you have, she would say. No blue for the sky, make it purple. If Jesus' hair was green instead of black, the teacher wouldn't mind. She taught us to paint Jesus with our own colors. Max goes on to say, God made you to do likewise. He loaded your life with a certain box of crayons, certain crayons. And friends, the crayons that you were given, maybe you have a unique shade that only you can color with. Nobody else will have that in the world. And he wants you to color Christ with the crayons he gave you. He doesn't want us to have crayon envy, okay? Okay. God gave you a unique set of crayons. Now, you may need some big ones like I do because I'm a big guy, okay? But the point is, is to use the crayons God's given you to color Jesus. You know, I'm excited to see the expressions of Jesus throughout this church and this community. As people take their crayons, they say, God, I'll use what you've given me and I'll make a difference in my world. 
Friends, my challenge to each of us is go color Jesus with the crayons that he's given us. Let's pray together. I want you to use, I ask you to use that crayon as a reminder of your uniqueness and and the contribution that God wants you to make with your life. You know, I believe that God brought us here not by accident this morning, but he wants you to know that you're loved, deeply loved by him. He wants you to know that you can leave this place today knowing that your sins are forgiven. They're completely forgiven. God wants to take the mess of your life and and bring a message from it. He's He's doing that all over this church with people. Will you let him do that to you and for you? It starts by just opening your heart up to him and realizing he's the only one that can forgive our sins. There's no priest that can do that. There's no pastor that can do that. It is simply through coming to Jesus and admitting your need for him. So if that's the cry of your heart this morning, I'm gonna just lead you in a prayer. And you can just pray this quietly where you're at this morning. Jesus, I need you. I admit admit today that I've sinned against you and others in my life. Today I ask you to forgive my sin. Wash me clean. Jesus, today I choose to follow you. God, would you take the mess of my life and bring a message from it? Maybe you're here this morning and some of us may be wasting opportunities that God is bringing to us. Maybe we have have head down going so fast at life we forget that the reason we're here is to show God's love to others. So maybe this is a time of saying, Lord, would you just help me to slow down and open my eyes. And for others of us here who maybe have walked with Jesus for a while, would you just ask him to give you those divine appointments this week? Those times when you know it is your uniqueness, God's grace, and people's needs that are intersecting, and you're making a difference. Father, thank you that you choose a holy God to use sinful people like us, broken people, messed up people like us. And Lord, you've given each person in this room some crayons and you want us to go color Jesus the best we know how with what you've given us. Help us to do that, Lord. I ask in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.